Hello, everybody. Today I have with me Hilary, who is a new mama and a very interesting person. So, Hilary, I'd love for you to introduce yourself for our listeners, please, because you know yourself better than I do. Sure. Uh, hi. I'm really happy to be here, so thanks for having me. Um, I am a, a journalist and an editor. Um, I uh, edit the literary magazine uh, Guernica, um, and until recently, I was uh, the editorial director of a, a, an imprint called Bold Type Books, which um, publishes books on m most mostly social justice themes. Um, so uh, there are a couple of books on maternal health in there. Um, and yeah, I've been interested in, in reproductive justice for, I don't know, maybe a, a decade or so. Um, and that's, yeah, that's about it. I, I had my first baby uh, four months ago now. Um, and so sort of a lot of things that I had been reading about and learning about independently have become my life. <laughs> Yeah, that's the funny thing about childbirth is suddenly you have a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, usually you have a baby. I mean, yeah, usually yeah. you have a baby. Most most times you have a baby. That's or true. if you don't have a baby, you're still a mother, and that's even a harder harder road. But um, so when how how did you decide where and how you wanted to give birth? Hmm. Well, I think that I always imagine that I would give birth at home. I, I never really imagined anything different um, for myself, mostly because I have always felt sort of threatened by the medical system in general. Um, I haven't had wonderful luck with doctors, unfortunately. Um, and it's, it's hard to say sort of what part of that is my own bad luck and what part of that is just sort of inevitabilities related to the medical establishment. But some combination of those two things has made it so that mostly when I've left doctor's appointments, I felt sort of demoralized. Um, and so I never imagined giving birth in, in a hospital space. Um, and I guess... I, because my partner and I travel so much, I didn't really know where I would be. And so I didn't really imagine giving birth in a, a birth center either, because I wasn't really sure that there even would be a birth center, um, you know, where, where we were. But I, but I knew that wherever, wherever we were, there would be a a house of some kind, whether, you know, a place that we were staying in or a place that we were borrowing or, you know, there's always like some, some space that's going to be available. And so I knew that I would give birth at home. Um, and it turned out, um, finally that, you know, we had spent a really good part of my pregnancy in Mexico. Um, and I, and I thought very hard about giving birth in Mexico for a lot of reasons. Um, and ultimately, we decided to come back to Montreal, where I was born, because we have so many friends here and we have family here. Um, and so I didn't just give birth at home, but I gave birth in, in sort of my home or my home for the last couple of years anyway. Um, and so, yeah, that, that decision was um, seemed pretty natural to me. Uh, but the way in which I gave birth, um, I mean, I can, I, yeah, there's a lot to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I can, I can dive in if you'd like. Uh, let's, um, let's let our listeners wonder for a few minutes yes. while we go to some other questions. Um, yes. and actually I am going to take over here cause I just realized something. So, so uh, just telling everyone that uh, before I, uh, s most times before I do a interview, I, 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 I spend a little time um, really centering and I sometimes use, well, quite often I use tarot to help me do that. And uh, I didn't have a chance because my family's all crazy today. 
And, you know, by the way, moms, new moms, even with adult children, life gets crazy. So just <laughs> saying it's it's a lifelong job. But um, so I pulled the sun and I realized, you know, I know Hillary personally, and she has always been like such a bright orange, bright yellow, golden personality. Mm-hmm. So I think the I think that I think that card was actually you, Hillary, and not anything oh, to do with with you. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's let's ask this question then: what what guided you, or who guided you in your decisions about um, about how and and where you wanted to give birth? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's. It's a big question, and I guess sort of the the shorter answer is to say that I went, I, I see myself as having gone through this kind of um, really involved process that started some years ago uh, when at, I came to the subject as a writer, um, and I essentially spent time um at first i was really interested in the postpartum period and the lack of um of postpartum culture in the united states which is where i was living at the time and sort of that led me down this little rabbit hole and i the further that i have sort of proceeded down that hole um the, the closer i've i've come to what is you know which i can what i can now say is my own birth experience so i mean essentially i i started thinking about the fact i can remember very clearly this moment where i started thinking about the fact um that women were giving birth lying down and um and i think that that for me was really this this huge moment where i i understood for the first time that um you know that most birth experiences that a lot of things that were happening during childbirth were not um were not optimal for the birthing person but were actually just prioritizing the facility and the needs of um the obstetrician and that sort of sent me into uh an interest in the the birthing environment so i spent maybe a whole year just sort of obsessing about the fact that you know how can we give birth with fluorescent lights and with noise and you know doesn't everybody know that the optimal birth environment is one that's quiet and private and you know and that sort of led me into the similarities between birth and sex and I started reading um Sheila Kitzinger's birth and sex and and sort of um realizing that there's so many comparisons that you can make between the two um and so I just I have like increasingly become sort of interested just bouncing from like one one thing to the next um, until I finally wound up taking this course uh, online while we were in Mexico with these two doulas who live in California um, and they their platform is called Your Badass Natural Birth and what I, what I realized in that class is that. It had been like some years that I had thinking about that I had been thinking about birthing positions and an environment, and that actually there's like there was still so much that I hadn't even considered, um, and and it just really radicalized the shit out of me. Like you know, I I had been thinking about environment, but I hadn't necessarily been thinking about consent. Uh, I hadn't even questioned. You know, I I hadn't come to a a point where I was questioning the necessity of things like cervical checks. Like it just these two doulas really sent my partner and I um, into, you know, a whole new realm of like learning. Um, And I think it's really then that I that I thought to myself, like, okay, it seems that the more that we learn, um, the further that we're heading down this path that is clearly bringing us to a place where we're mostly going to be on our own, which is not to say without support, um, but without interference. And so it's, it's, it just became increasingly clear that 
that with what we were what we were picking up that we would sort of have to wind up being largely unassisted that's so i'm i'm thinking about a couple of things while while you're speaking and i'm not going to move on to my next question cuz something came up for me and it's been coming up with um with the women that I'm working with now who are really also interested in, uh, in not being, um, interfered with during their birth experience. And so uh, there's a whole lot of courses out there and they're very good. Some of them are like they're, they're, they 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 range from excellent to very good to, I mean, ridiculous, but many of them are very good. And I know that, uh, you know, you can just go online and, and sign up like you could spend thousands literally with yeah. all these courses and preparations and this and that and the other thing, which is great. I love that women are taking things into their own hands and gaining knowledge and doing courses and creating that, that, that kind of um, almost a wave of, of, of understanding at the same time, what I really try to guide um the women that come to me and and the and the birth attendants that want to train with me, I try to guide us all back to. Uh, I mean, we have an innate and understand. Like, no one did anyone teach you how to have sex? Like, I don't know. Maybe yeah. that happens for everyone else, but it didn't happen for me. Like, I mean, I'm just being sarcastic now, but yeah. basically, <laughs> there is an innate understanding that your body has and that you have. How many courses do we need to take to access that innate understanding? I think that's a big question. And I mean, yeah, what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think I completely agree. And I think that so much of this is, is intuition in the end. Maybe, maybe all of it is intuition in the end. And I think that, you know, what that course sort of did for me and the reason why one was enough is because I just wound up needing the permission in in a sense to to just tap into that intuition and block everything else out and I don't think that I really uh before that course even though I had like progressively been interested in things like you know, position or setting or this and that, like all of these sort of basics, that course really, what it said to me ultimately was, you can say no to anything. You can tap into your intuition uh, in, in any sphere from, you know, from beginning with tests in pregnancy and moving along to um, you know, how you get checked if you're going in to be checked by a provider, moving along to, you know, when you call whoever you want to call, if you want to call someone to attend to your birth. Like, I didn't know, you know, and when I speak to people now, even people who are interested in birth and interested in empowering themselves, um, you know, the, the often this sort of permission that you give yourself stops at uh, a certain point, like it's, it stops at, okay, well, I don't, I'm going to fight with anyone who tells me that I have to be on my back and, and I'm going to make sure that the lights are off. Um, but I just had no idea. I never, I never, imagined and you know and and I had been already writing about it for like seven or eight years and I never even imagined declining cervical checks like for me that's such a big one because it's mm. so ubiquitous like nobody would you know if I think that it's 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 really not common knowledge um even among people who want a low interference or no interference birth um, that you can say no to a cervical check or why that would serve you. Um, and, uh, or that you can say no to a gestational diabetes test and why that would serve you. Um, and so to have it sort of laid out in front of me, um, by those two doulas, it, it, it 
was not only educational, but it, it really, you know, the message loud and clear was really, you can be relying on your intuition from the beginning to the end of this process um, and just go for it. Yes. Yeah. I, that's really interesting. So basically the course, and it could be a course, it could be something else, but basically whatever it was, was a catalyst for yes, you. Definitely. To yeah. give you that permission. And it's so fascinating because you're someone that was already reasonably educated. Like you said, you were writing about it for seven to eight years. So, so you needed that active living catalyst in order to give yourself the permission to to be a powerful birthing woman. Definitely. I think that, you know, they're just, I would have, I would have given birth at home anyway, but I, you know, even in the beginning of the course, I was so concerned about, we were learning a lot and I kept having this thought of, well, you know, what's the sense of learning all of this if I'm not going to be able to find a provider who's going to support me in in any of this? Yeah. Um, and that was a huge problem for me for a long time. I just kept, you know, after every class, I'd say, okay, well, now I, I, I know, now I sort of feel the permission to, to use my intuition in these spheres and I know that I'm going to sort of wind up in a in a conflict with with any provider in Quebec, certainly. Um, and so, what is really even the sense of of knowing that I want to decline something, and why if I'm not going to be sort of given the permission to decline it? And and by the end of the course, I understood that that none of that 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 didn't even matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even that yeah. part didn't matter because it's it's you know, it's you you start out thinking, "Oh, okay, I can follow my intuition um from A to Z, uh and I don't need anyone's permission." And if you get far enough along, when well, you wind up telling yourself like, "Okay, I I'm sh I'm I'm sure as hell not going to have somebody accompany me." and be here for while I'm birthing who, who isn't, it, it begins to seem impossible. Um, the idea of having somebody be there who isn't on the same page as you. Um, and so the, for me anyway, the, the inevitable conclusion was if it, if it has to be no one, that it has to be no one. Um, and actually the, the truth is, is that it, it wasn't no one because suddenly I was really surrounded by people like yourself, um, all of whom just sort of arrived in my life um, in, a, in, in such miraculous ways, a, a midwife in Mexico uh, and someone who had sort of just finished their training at the school in Trois-Rivières but hadn't started practicing yet, and all of whom just offered um, to sort of be around by phone or by video or um, in in the months leading up to pregnancy and during the birth. And so the support was very much there, um, but none of those people could be here for the actual birth. And uh, I think there's like a, a real reason for that because we were sort of meant to, the, the, the message of all of this learning was just, you know, we were meant to just sort of go for it on our own. So what do you think makes your experience so different from, from so many experiences we hear about? Because, I mean, I know women, and women are strong. We're strong creatures, you know. We really are. We do a lot of stuff. And it always amazes me. Um, I'm actually going through some interviews that I did two years ago uh, of, of women who had um, suffered pretty traumatic birth experiences. I have 41 interviews to go through all together, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, these are not weak women that didn't that don't have any intuition. So what mm -hmm. what could it be that 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 made your experience so different that allowed you to 
to really own the experience of both rather than having to throw yourself under someone else's bus? I think that it is not necessarily easy to to sort of embrace, to, to say, okay, there are um, there are risks associated with birth. There, just like there are risks associated with anything, um, and we're talking about human life, and um, and it's 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 not easy for everyone, even when you're looking at because so a huge part of that of that course, if we want to talk about what that course sort of actually was, was doing is they were just making information available to the attendees. So this is, these are the latest scientific studies and this is the actual risk involved. Like instead of just talking to an obstetrician, who's going to say to you like, Oh, I think your baby might be measuring small. And so, uh, you know, your baby might not be able to handle contractions. There's no might, there's no, there were no hypotheticals in this course. There's no vague language. It's just, here's the study. You know, if you are pregnant for longer than 42 weeks, here is here are the chances of stillbirth um, as compared to, you know, at 39 weeks or whatever it is. It's just, it, it was data. Um, and I think that for a lot of people, it's like, even with that that data, it's hard to sort of just say the risk is small and and it's not true that the only thing that's important here um, is just that everyone get out alive. Um, you know, there are, there are, I'm a person in this too. Um, and I'm allowed to weigh, this is a, a reasonable calculation like that I'm allowed to make. I'm allowed to say, the chances of something of something happening to my baby in this case is 0.0002%. And I will be much, much more comfortable and empowered as a birthing person and my labor will go faster. Um, and it will be a better experience for me if I take this action. And so even though there's a 0.0002% chance of something going wrong, I'm going to, this is the action that I'm going to take. Um, because I'm a person in this scenario. I'm the, I'm the person in this scenario. I'm the active person. Um, and I think that, you know, I think it's probably helpful that we, my, my partner and I are so used to sort of making calculations <laughs> like that, not, not with regards to birth or, you know, necessarily with regards to another human life, but just, I, we're not, um, we, we are not, um, you know, hugely conservative people and we, we do things and we calculate risk and, and we, um, and we interrogate situations and, and wonder about, our safety, like where we travel and we hitchhike and we, and so I'm really used to saying like, you know, the chances of something going wrong in this situation are extremely, extremely low. And so I'm going to go for it. Um, and so it felt really natural to me to, to do that in the, in the birth setting. Like there just wasn't any fear there. Um, I, we made the decisions that we made and, and, we felt really, really comfortable and they felt very natural to us. Um, and I will say though, this is a whole other topic, but I was so terrified of, of motherhood um, because I'm so interested in women's health, but I know so little about babies. And I'm finding that it really is the same thing in motherhood where there's just so much out there if you want to tap into it about the risk of I don't know, you know, if you're co-sleeping of a blanket being within however many inches of your baby. And it's just, if you, if you want to head in that direction, you can really scare yourself out of a lot of things mm. that feel very intuitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot to think and talk about because I mean, I mean, my philosophy has always been, 
um, after working with women for so long, um, I've seen things that are just not statistically even possible happen to people. Yeah. Um, so my, my, my kind of motto is shit happens. And it's really like, how are you going to deal with it? Like, what choices are you going to make around that? Are you going to wrap yourself in bubble wrap and make sure that you have all the, all the tests and all the things? Or are you going to, you know, live and be reasonably careful? It always comes back to my favorite um, little saying from the Quran, which is uh, pray to Allah, but tie your camel to a tree. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly it. So if a newly pregnant woman came to you and didn't know anything at all about anything and asked you for, a, for advice, what, what kind of advice would you give her? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question because it's it's happening <laughs> in my life. It's like there there are people who around me who are pregnant and um and I'm, you know, the person in their lives who is given birth recently. Um and it's been interesting to navigate because, you know, I I feel like I'm a pretty outspoken person and I feel very passionate about these things. And I felt passionate about them even before giving birth. And, um, and so now I feel sort of doubly, (laughs) um, fired up and, and I guess, you know, I, I'm trying really hard to sort of, I guess at the end of the day, everyone, the best you can hope for is that the, the person who is pregnant, um, the best you can hope for is for them to have the experience that they want. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard for me to remember that what they want is, is not what I wanted. (laughs) And so I guess, you know, I just, I, I guess I would encourage that person um, to ask questions of, of whoever it is they're involving in their birth, um, and to, to really understand, um, that they can, that they can refuse any kind of, um, care that, that doesn't make them feel comfortable, that they can switch providers at any time. Um, and yeah, I, I, I really, um, I really feel that there's no, particular like one size fits all advice but I um except for to have a doula really (laughs) Mm, I I really you know like I was talking to a pregnant woman the other day who I can see that her priorities are really different than mine she's a much more conservative person I know that she knows already that she wants to give birth in the hospital and she knows already that she wants to um have an epidural Uh, and so my advice to her was just, you know, she hadn't been considering a doula because even though it's 2022, it seems a lot of people still think that having a doula is sort of like a radical act. And it means that, you know, you're like goodness on the fringe. (laughs) Wow. And I had to sit and say to her, like, listen, it doesn't matter if you don't identify with me. It doesn't matter like what kind of birth you want to have, I'm telling you that in any case, if you are in a hospital room with a bunch of people and you have a doula, the doula is going to be the only person who is just working for you and who is only concerned about what you want. Because even your husband is going to be thinking about you know, potentially worried about the safety of the baby and having his own, you know, emotions because it's his kid uh, getting in the way potentially between your priorities and what you want. Um, and, And the doula will never be sort of, she just wants you to to have the best experience possible. And she's the only person in the room who is only thinking about that. Um, and so just, it would just be um, just to, to your detriment only to, to not have someone there who is just working for you. 
Um, and so that's really the best advice that I could give her, I think. Um, and I also just tried to make her understand that even if, you know, I, I said the word birth plan, um, and, and she sort of like shuddered, <laughs> like, why would I need a birth plan if I just know that I'm going into the hospital? But I said, you know, you don't, you just to have somebody sit with you and lay out your priorities, even if they're as simple as I'd like to arrive at the hospital at a time when I won't have to sit in triage for hours. Like I don't want to arrive at the, the hospital at a time when they're going to turn me away to go back home. Um, because you know, I'm, I'm like far, far from ready. And I, I want a playlist and I want, uh, I don't want students in the room. It's like, even that is that that's a plan. I mean, that yeah. are priorities, um, that you can be thinking about. And I think that that sort of really affected her. Well, I'm glad because one of the things that I'm really adamant about is, um, is I really believe that a woman that goes into the hospital and, you know, gets an epidural or accepts all the interventions and has, you know, 10 people do VAG exams or whatever it is, should be treated with respect no matter what. And that sadly is, is the one thing that's missing a lot of the times in hospital care. So yeah, for me, it's not so much where you choose to give birth. I mean, of course it is because I've decided that you know, the hospitals are just not, they're not working for us anymore. I don't think they ever did. But um, nowadays, especially in Montreal, it's so, so important for a woman to have a doula as she goes in. Um, yeah, just for all of the reasons that you said and more, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of rudeness and resentment and violence that goes on within the hospital, a hierarchy that doesn't belong in a birth room. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just, you know, I just sort of said to her, like, if there's a decision to make, and you're in the middle of giving birth, um, and whoever it is you have with you, if it's your husband, if it's your mother, they're like, so emotionally wrapped up in what's going on. It's like, it's, it's for me, it's non negotiable, if there's some big decision to make. Um, and there's like a team of nurses, sort of, telling you that you have a one minute, 30 seconds to make it. It's like, you need someone who's going to be able to create some space and some quiet for you. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's not necessarily going to be your family member. Um, so, yeah, it's amazing in that, in that course that we took, I could see this doesn't, this is not applicable here in Montreal, I don't think, but uh, one of the pieces of advice that those two doulas gave uh, the people in our class, most of whom were from the U.S., that was like the most helpful to people was that at any time in the States, in the hospital, you could say, I, I, we'd like to take a minute to pray <laughs> and everyone has to leave the room and leave you alone. <laughs> Excellent. I just thought that was so funny and amazing. Yeah. Like, yeah. You see where the priorities lie, but it is absolutely a really yeah. great tool. Like, we need to pray, so get out of here. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. So, um, you're a book person and a word person, and um, a lot of what I think about is language in the birth room and around surrounding our our thoughts and. Uh, culture of birth. What do you think we can do to change um, the way we give birth in terms of the language that we use? Just if there's anything that's come come up for you over over through your your experience. I mean, the thing that comes to mind for me immediately when you say that is like I started to I started to see sort of how the language gestures at the sort of dismal <laughs> situation in which we find ourselves. Like, for instance, I started to think a lot about the term failure to progress, because it was the thing that was just coming up over and over and over. Every time, you know, I when I sat down at, at, 
to ask my midwife, like, you know, what is your transfer rate and, and why, what is the number one reason that you wind up transferring people to the hospital? And she said, failure to progress. And then I looked at, you know, this sort of abysmal C-section rate and, and, and what is contributing to it, um, primarily and its failure to progress. Um, and there's this like wonderful book that's just come out. Um, that's also, uh, uh, it was first a, a really, po- and is still a really popular Instagram account. Um, but the book is called rest, rest is resistance by, by Trisha, uh, Hurst. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, who runs this thing called the nap ministry and it's, yes. like, really, yeah. it's it. and it's just that it's exactly, you know, what it sounds like rest as, as resistance, rest as a way of resisting capitalism and resisting white supremacy. And I just, you know, I, I, so many people have, um, have sort of embarked on this journey with her and and the idea really resonates. And it, it really got me thinking about how failure, failure to progress is, is just, um, that language is so, sort of interwoven with our kind of grind culture and obsession with moving forward and moving forward in a way that's linear um, and just and and progressing sort of as quickly as possible and being efficient. And it's just everything that I've learned about birth, um, especially on a personal level, it is, is that it points to the fact that it has nothing to to do with that it that it that it doesn't necessarily progress in a straight line that it doesn't necessarily you know that it's not a job that you could wake up and do as quickly and efficiently as as possible um and when it gets treated that way like okay you know the obstetrician has a golf game at 3 p.m and we need to get everything wrapped up by then well that's like when you encounter problems um and so here we are using this term like failure to progress as if, you know, I don't know, as if you like failed a class or an exam or a, when we're talking about just like physiological functioning of the body. Um, and, and yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about like birth and capitalism essentially mm, yeah. and, and the words that we use um, and trying to write about it. I've been trying to write about it a little bit. And, you know, I have a friend who who was at a, a birthing center in Montreal and they told her, you know, you're you're failing to progress. But otherwise, like mother was healthy and baby was healthy and everything was fine. Um, and I remember when I asked you, like, what happens if your contractions uh, are really strong and then they sort of get weak or stop for a bit? And you told me, well, I don't know, go take a nap, like <laughs> go, just go lie down. Um, and this, this friend of mine told me that at the birthing center, when she was failing to progress, they made her start to do the stairs. So walk yeah. up and down the stairs for two hours, um, just up and down the stairs, like a person in labor until she was so exhausted that like, of course, the only outcome was going to be a hospital transfer with an epidural. Like she's just been walking the stairs for two hours. Like birth is hard enough without that. (laughs) Oh my God. Like walking stairs. Like if I want a really good workout and when I'm training for a marathon, I'll go walk up and down the stairs for two hours. Literally. That's it. It's like, why add a marathon to a marathon? Um, that's capitalism. (laughs) It certainly is. It certainly is. And what makes me more sad than anything else about your story is that, you know, student midwives go in with love and care and an open heart, and they come out talking about failure to progress and incompetent services and the rupture of membranes and geriatric pregnancies. And it's just so sad. It's so, it's so sad that other women have been co-opted into this, this, this machine yeah no absolutely geriatric pregnancy always has me laughing <laughs> i know right well incompetent cervix the cervix just makes me really also, yeah, annoyed a good one. and failure to progress is just so sad because it seems to be increasing i mean that language that label seems to be you know there's an there's a an epidemic of failure to progress language going on 
for sure. And it's just like, it's considered so normal. It's like, yeah. when you really think about those terms, it's like for a woman to walk away from her birth thinking, oh, well, that didn't go as I planned because I failed to progress. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I failed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, we do need to change language and it's a, it's a, it's, I think every time we use different language, it makes, it makes a difference. It has a ripple effect. For sure. Yeah. So what has your postpartum experience been like? Well, it's been, it's been interesting. It's been the first, uh, let's say month was characterized by sort of the greatest high I've ever had in my life. <laughs> and I really was not expecting that. I was expecting that more in in labor. Um, and I did sort of like, you know, I was on another planet in labor, but I it's it I really felt afterwards for that first month like I was on drugs. I mean, really. Um, it just I my hormone it was so intense hormonally, I was laughing I mean, I was laughing at everything all day long. People were looking at me like I was nuts. <laughs> and so that was kind of amazing. And then, you know, after a few weeks, I was like, shit, I'm afraid that I'm going to crash. Like, I, you know, uh, because you go so uh -huh. high, you can't, you know, if you've ever had a drug experience, you know, like you just, you can't go that high without sort of crashing down. And so I was a little bit worried about that. Definitely, I've sort of, I've landed, <laughs> but I, I didn't have like the, the, you know, the big crash that I was uh, apprehensive of, luckily, and that's really nice. But I am, um, but I, I've grounded myself and, and we're here now with the baby and I feel very, very lucky to sort of be at home with my partner. Essentially, I just, I can't fathom doing this, like it, if, if, if if my husband had gone back to work after a couple of weeks um, and we had like, we have a, you know, a quote unquote easy baby just in that she's not colicky. She's not crying around the clock. She cries very little. And so I just am like, this is so difficult. <laughs> and we're too um, with a, a baby who doesn't cry very much. Like I, I can't imagine what this could look like. You know, and I think, um, yeah, I think like I really had a, a good window into even when I was very high, I could feel how quickly, how easy it would be for me to sort of fall into a hole. Um, and I, I could feel that the line between that sort of postpartum ecstasy um, and the opposite of it is very thin, actually. Um, and that, yeah. that's very scary. Um, and so, yeah, I'm like, I'm grateful to have stayed on, on one side of the line, but I, I really, I really understood how quickly you can sort of ping pong around. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. You know, you'll remember that when we, when we met, I was so concerned about the fact that I didn't know anything about babies. <laughs> um, and I, I really have seen that, um, you know, what's worked for me is just I've to take that confidence from um, from the birth and to to bring it into my mothering where I'm just like, I don't care. Like, I, I don't I don't want to go down that road where I'm I'm reading about this, the scary things and all the reasons why, like. I, you know, shouldn't sleep with the baby or wear her constantly or this or that. Like I just am, I'm going by my own intuition and, and, uh, and that feels good to me. And, and, you know, and I feel that, that we know her well enough to know sort of what's good for her. And so that's been really great, but I guess postpartum healing wise, I still feel very fragile actually, like especially bodily. Like I, you know, I still have some heaviness sometimes. I still feel like, I still feel like somebody in recovery and I'm almost four months on. So, you know, that also made me think a lot about our, our expectations of, uh, of people who have just given birth and, you know, my maternity leave ended on October 1st. 
Um, and I just never went back to work. I just, uh, I'm, I'm just not going to do my job anymore. <laughs> Um, oh, you what? You're working for an American company or something? Yeah, I'm working for an American company, and so oh, I had wow. four, okay. four months of maternity leave. Yeah, and I decided, you know, like that's the the project was like changing forms, and and anyway, it it just made sense for me to sort of walk away from it. Yeah, um, and I just keep thinking to myself, like, but what if? But what if I had started work again on October 1st? Um, and what if, you know, I took that job for an American company during the pandemic. So we sort of started out with me, you know, the it's always been me working from home. But I easily at some point um, could have been sort of called to the office. And so there could have been a situation in which on October 1st, I had to start going into the office every day. Um, yeah. And that's like the reality for a lot of people. For and, most, so for, yeah, so many people in the U.S. Yeah. And so I just thought like, but what would I do? Like, what would I, I've never been away from the baby for more than two hours. Like what, yeah. like, what would that even look like? I can't yeah. fathom it, honestly. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's hard to fathom. Um, but I think one of the exceptional ways to kind of, um, keep people in line is to divide mothers and children. So, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Do you think, cause you said in the beginning that you were looking at postpartum or the lack of postpartum culture in the U S. So do you think that if you had had more of a kind of like, um, I would say like a, if there was more ceremony, or a ritual um, around your postpartum period, do you think that you would be feeling differently? Well, I, so I'll say, so I, okay, a couple of things. One, one thing I just want to say is that the way that I got into looking at postpartum culture in the U.S. is because before I lived in the U.S., I lived in Hong Kong. Um, and that's how I became interested in maternal health because um, I started talking to some, I started talking to some people in China and in Hong Kong about sitting the month. So doing this like 40 days of, um, of just, you know, rest and, and that incorporates everything from nutrition to sort of how, how, and if you should be showering or going outside and just receiving care from your relatives um, and it was really interesting because th the reason I started looking at it is because um, the sitting the month tradition was sort of modernizing at the time. It was taking new forms in uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan and, and China um, where sort of modern women were saying, I don't really want my mother-in-law to come take care of me <laughs> for over a month because <laughs> that doesn't feel so comfortable, but I'd like to sort of observe this time anyway. Um, and so these baby hotels were popping up all over the place. Um, and I would go visit um, women in these baby hotels who were spending the 40 days there just in total rest. And it was absolutely mind blowing for me because you know, I'd walk into a room and there'd be someone with their, who had just given birth with her baby in a bathrobe and lying in bed. And I'd say, well, how has this postpartum period been for you? And she'd say, oh, it's been like the most restful, like just beautiful experience of my life. I've been so pampered. Um, and it was just such a shock for me to hear that from someone who had just given birth coming from where I was coming from, because, yeah. you know, it's just like so, so much the opposite um, in other cultures. Um, and so I thought about that a lot in my own postpartum period. And I'd say that even sort of knowing what I know and and having the, you know, the first 40 days book on my shelf and and trying so hard to to just stay here for that time and rest um it, it wasn't easy it was like I had to fight off visitors and I had to fight off like um you know uh, just outings and and everybody wants 
to rush you. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's, it's really, really hard to do otherwise. Like even if you, you have told yourself that you're absolutely going to do otherwise. And so there's a part of me, like I really, um, I really, I loved that, that first month of cocooning and I, I do wish it had gone on for longer. Um, and so, you know, recently I said to myself, like, given that, like, given that I'm realizing now um, that that sort of fragility lasts for so long, I I don't see why I can't just continue to give myself that kind of care. Like, just because it's past the first 40 days doesn't mean anything. Um, and so I had these two Mexican doulas come, and they came last week, a week ago today, to do a closing of the bones ceremony. And it was so beautiful. Um, and it was just a full day for me. I, they came for like six hours and they fed me and they bathed me and they wrapped me in rebozos and the scarves and they, you know, and they, they gave, they made me cacao and they, you know, we set our intentions and it was so beautiful. And it's like, they usually do that like a typical time to do a closing of the bone ceremony is at six weeks. And it's like, you know, I'm already at four months, but I, I really think that, you know, it's, it's, I had trapped myself by thinking like, oh, my postpartum period is over. I didn't call these women early enough. So I can't have this now. It's like, it's just four months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm so glad you had that. That was amazing. It was really wonderful. Yeah. So if you were going to recommend any books, actual books for a pregnant woman to read, um, would you read, would you recommend books or? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, they're just like, there's so much, it's, it's difficult because there's so much out there and I'm sure you run to, into the same thing where you don't know whether to sort of like bombard someone with reading or to tell them not to read anything at all. Um, but you know, I, I, I love actually that series, this, the, like, um, the, the first 40 days book. Um, also there's a book about, um, fertility and another one now that just came out uh, about pregnancy and they're all, they're mostly about nutrition, um, by this place called mother bees. Uh, and I really love those books. Um, the first 40 days has like a, just a lot of amazing recipes and, um, and just, you know, things about if you're interested in, in the sitting the month culture, um, things about how to take care of yourself postpartum that I found really, really nice. Um, and I'm trying to think what else I read, but a, a lot of things that I, you know, I, I had like a book about breastfeeding and, you know, I, I read maybe 15 pages of it and then said like, this is, this is like, I don't, it, it didn't feel like breastfeeding from the beginning has felt for me. It's just like this deeply intimate act and it's like so much about your cues and your baby's cues and how you like function together that reading a guide like that didn't it didn't feel helpful to me um you know if I had had um if I had had trouble I just would have called somebody over here uh to come watch us um and and to sort of like be part of that journey together so I think like a lot of my questions were just answered by the support community, which is, you yeah. know, another reason to get a doula because instead of like <laughs> yeah. to pour through something and see whether it answers your, your questions or not. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can just ask someone. Um, but I also, I have the fourth trimester by Kimberly Ann Johnson that I thought was interesting, but it, it combines like really a lot of different approaches Um but you'll see like a lot of the books I read were really about postpartum care um, and less about labor itself. Um, yeah. 
Well, I think that's one of the big problems with this um, with this abusive maternity care system that we have is that people get so wound up with the with the whole like organizing and th figuring out and, and making choices about their actual birth experience that they forget they're they're going to have a baby. That's it. Yeah, that's exactly, and that's I knew like that's where a lot of my anxiety was living, and so that's why I wound up just <laughs> reading about the fourth trimester. Um, and I think that that was really helpful because, you know, you can you can plan for your postpartum period in a way that you can't plan for your birth, I would say. It's like a lot of my birth planning was just emotional um, and no book could have really, you know, like taught me how to, to do that. It, it was just like, okay you know, once I sort of had assembled, you had given me a list of things to assemble in my home, like extra sheets and, you know, whatever, whatever items I needed. And I got everything together. And, uh, and after that, there was like nothing else that I could really do. Um, whereas with the postpartum period, I was like, okay, I will, uh, you know, make some pads and put them in the freezer. And I will like do some make some soup and put it in the freezer and like yeah. there are certain things that I can get together. And so it, you know, that felt like something I could sort of control. So, um, what are your plans now with a, with a new baby? Yeah. Well, we're thinking about going away. Um, we're always thinking about going away as it gets cold. <laughs> and so, it's it's now, so I'm, I'm thinking that we'll probably uh, go to Asia maybe in two months from now, like around Christmas time, and stay for around maybe four or five months. Um, it feels like a good time. I mean, it 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 we usually leave around this in this season, but it it feels like a good time with the baby to go because the baby can't walk <laughs> or like you know, say no to anything. <laughs> and so we just like sort of strap her to us and do what we've usually been doing. And so, um, and so it, it feels like it'll be easier to travel probably than when she's running around and we have to keep her from like throwing herself into oncoming traffic. <laughs> um, but we, uh, at five weeks, so we have a van with a, a mattress in the back and, uh, at five weeks I was like, okay, I need to know if she, is okay in the van or not, because it'll really make me feel sort of liberated if she is. Um, and so we just slept in my parents' driveway uh, in the van bed with the baby and she, and she slept wonderfully. Like she really, really, she probably slept better in the van than she did <laughs> she was at home. And so, oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. The traveling life. Yeah. So I think that, you know, I think that the, the change, the little change for us, um, already without a baby, increasingly, we were like van traveling rather than sort of hitchhiking or taking public transport. And I think with the baby, the, the van traveling will be the way to go since we have some extra stock now. And it's nice for her to have like a bed that she's used to. So we'll just yeah. move around that way. Yeah. So the final question I ask everyone, excuse me, is um, I just want you to give one word for our listeners. What If you had only one word, what would you give them? I I think rest. I really like, you know, I think that going back to what we were talking about before this sort of rest as resistance idea is, is it has been really powerful for me lately. And I think that there's a lot to take from it into the birthing experience. And so I, I, I would say rest, like there's only so much that you can do and there's only so much that you can plan and you don't have to be worried about failing to progress. You can just sort of rest. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you don't have to be worried about failing to progress. That's it. That's, it. that's so great. <laughs> um, you know, I just wanted to say that I I was just remembering now um, 
that I was at my brother's, my brother was living with a whole bunch of people uh, at one point and two of the people who he were living with, they were this really young couple, like 20 years old. And the woman was very pregnant. Um, and they came to his house and moved in and asked if they could give birth uh, at in the house in the bath in their bathtub. Um, and everyone agreed that that would be fine. And I went over to visit him and I overheard the two of them having this conversation about getting ready to give birth. And she was saying to him, like, you know, uh, we have to go to the dollar store so that you can pick up a net uh, in case I poop in the bathtub while I'm giving birth and you can scoop it out. And I said to myself, like, if these 20 year olds, and I was like 35 at the time, like, if these 20 year olds are just here calmly talking about going to the dollar store to get a poop, <laughs> <laughs> like, if they can do that, then I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Anybody can do that, you know, like, there's no yeah. need to get into such a sort of, yeah. Yeah. No need to torment yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.